Good morning and welcome to General Questions. Question one is in the name of Richard Simpson. I note that Mr Simpson is not here. I have had no explanation as to why he's not turned up and I would expect an explanation very soon. Question number two, Drew Smith. Good morning, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to resolve the industrial dispute at the National Museums of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, whilst pay negotiations are a matter for the Board of the National Museums of Scotland as employer, I have met with uh, both the Chair and Director of the Museums and representatives of the unions and strongly encouraged both sides to develop a more productive working relationship to try and resolve this dispute. Drew Smith. Uh, thank you. Can I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for that answer? I mean, the Minister uh, blames National Museum Scotland and uh, National Museum Scotland seem to blame um, the Scottish Government. This is not a complicated dispute. There are people uh, working side by side, doing the same job and getting different rates uh, of pay. Why is this uh, dispute going on? It's now 18 months. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary um, outline what action she will take uh, from today to get some resolution um, to this situation? Or per could she perhaps indicate how much money uh, it would cost to simply equalise the rates of pay so that those staff employed after 2011 uh, receive the weekend uh, allowance, uh, the same as the, the staff who have been employed there for longer? Cabinet uh, Secretary. The changes uh, don't affect existing staff who had um, the allowance. It was for new staff after 2011. I think it took longer than 18 months, indeed, for the concern to be raised um, at the time. In terms of the costs, uh, we have information from the National Museums of Scotland. It would cost uh, almost £400,000 a year. That would, over a spending review period, be £1.2 million. Um, as he's aware, uh, that both the Labour Party and the Conservatives have indicated that there would be further public sector cuts uh, coming after the next Westminster uh, elections. I think it would be be a challenge indeed to uh, identify £1.2 million over that period, unless the member can tell me otherwise. Neil Finlay. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, this is your responsibility. What have you done personally to try and bring this dispute to an end? Because this has been going on for 18 months, and every time you get asked questions, blame someone else, blame Westminster, blame the, the, the management museum. Do you have a museum. question, Mr Finlay? Can you Finlay? take responsibility and bring this dispute to an end? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as the member uh, knows and as I have indicated, uh, I have met with the unions on a number of occasions. I have facilitated better working relationships with NMS. Uh, we have uh, achieved progress in relation to a number of issues. However, the uh, question of the weekend allowances is one that is still uh, under dispute and I would encourage all sides um, to engage. That is not possible if the trade unions are saying that the only way that they will talk to management is if the full weekend allowance is, uh, is Re, you know, re, reintroduced immediately. That, that's not something that's possible. We need both sides to talk. And I personally have spoken to both sides and encouraged them. And I, I'm hopeful that uh, they can continue a dialogue, which they have been having over recent months, to get some resolution to this. But I have met with them, and I have taken this very seriously. And I've given as much information as is possible to all members when they have contacted me. Question three, Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to protect public services from the impact of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, since March last year, the Scottish Government has been raising concerns with the United Kingdom Government and the European Commission about the impact of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership negotiations on the National Health Service and other public services. We are continuing to press the case for an explicit exemption for the NHS and other public services from TTIP. As the First Minister has said, no ifs and no buts, there must be an, there must be an explicit protection for the NHS on the face of the agreement. Christina McKelvey. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Last week at the SUC Congress, the text, following text was adopted. The UK reserves the right to adopt or maintain any measure with regard to the organisation, the funding and the provision of the National Health Service in the UK, as well as with regard to public and or other not-for-profit character of the National Health Service in the UK, where services may be provided by different companies and or public or private entities involving competitive elements which are thus not services carried out exclusively in the exercises of the Government authority. Can the Cabinet Secretary reassure us here today and the many, many people who are interested in this uh, TTIP agreement that he will take that text to the UK Government's next um, intergovernmental meeting? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I think the, 
the, the wording that uh, Christina McKelvey has read out is a welcome contribution to this issue from the Scottish Trade Union Congress. Um, it is uh, work that's been undertaken to define the legal terms that would provide necessary exemption and to ensure that the National Health Service and other public services were exempt from TTIP. As the uh, Culture and External Affairs Secretary made clear in the parliamentary debate yesterday, and as I have made clear in the written response from the Government to the Committee and their helpful and informative report on this subject, the Government is determined to ensure that we have wording that is sufficiently tight to put beyond doubt to our and the public's concerns that TTIP uh, will have no effect on the Government's ability to determine how and by whom the National Health Service and other public services are provided. Question number four, Stuart Maxwell. I asked the Scottish Government what the findings were from its pilot project to monitor assault injury surveillance in NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson. As part of Building Safer Communities, we are continuing to work with partners at a national and local level to reduce violence in Scotland. This pilot project helped to improve our understanding of violence within our communities. The views of key individuals involved in the pilot project were sought and recommendations were identified relating to improved structure and governance of the project. Improved staff involvement and collation of data have all helped to inform further developments in our overall approach to violence reduction initiatives in Scotland. A public health report titled Violence Prevention, a public health priority published in December last year, outlined recommendations to roll out injury surveillance across all health board areas. At present, there are three health boards in Scotland, Fife, Lanarkshire and Lothians, who are capturing injury surveillance data. Mr Maxwell. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? However, the Cabinet Secretary may be aware that I have been pursuing this issue since 2006 and hope to see progress soon in implementing a policy that I believe will help reduce knife crime across Scotland. I have a letter dated May 2013 from his predecessor as Justice Secretary in which he states, I agree that injury surveillance can be very useful to both the police and the NHS and my officials are continuing to work with the partners in NHS Lanarkshire, Police Scotland and the Violence Reduction Unit to learn from their experiences in piloting this approach in Lanarkshire. Once we have a picture of what work is taking place across Scotland, we will look to see what assistance we can give in rolling this out further. In light of that response, is the Cabinet Secretary able to tell me when we are likely to see a rollout of an injury surveillance system across the country? Cabinet Secretary. Episcopal Officer, I am aware of the Member's long-standing interest in this matter, which I uh, believe he first raised back in 2006. Um, uh, the report I made reference to is the Public Health Report, which was published in December of last year. One of its key recommendations was for each of our boards to identify a public health uh, lead who will be responsible for taking forward uh, this particular area of work. Uh, alongside that, the report also makes a range of recommendations on what areas of priority uh, these lead officials should then take forward within their individual board area in capturing the information and making sure they have the right system in place. Uh, the report also recommends that the leads uh, should establish an emergency department violence surveillance programme in each of their board areas by January 2016. So we are continuing to work with the uh, boards on this matter, along with the Violence Reduction Unit and Police Scotland, and we will continue to work with them to make sure that we make progress on this matter. Thank you. Question number five in the name of Richard Baker has not been lodged and the explanation has been less than satisfactory. In the case of Richard Simpson, who uh, just missed question number one, Mr Simpson made the best effort he could to get here um, and I hope that you're recovering. Question number six, Colin Keir. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what help is available to local authorities to upgrade infrastructure to support new housing and commercial developments. Minister Marco Biaggi. Uh, between 2014 and 2016, the Scottish Government expects to secure infrastructure investment of over £8 billion, helping to support economic activity and the delivery of public services in communities across Scotland. Uh, through the use of innovative financial models such as tax incremental financing and the growth accelerator model, the Scottish Government, together with the Scottish Futures Trust, is working closely with a number of local authorities and other partners to deliver local investment that supports regeneration and growth. Thank you for his response. Can he tell me exactly who is responsible for the infrastructure upgrades to accommodate any new development? Minister. 
Well, it's a key principle of the planning system that the impact of new development on existing infrastructure should be mitigated. And where there is an impact, a planning obligation can be used under Section 75. Uh, this would set out what the developer is legally required to provide and uh, may include the requirement for a financial contribution. But that's one of many sources of, of financial contributions. And it's important to note the Scottish Government provides uh, this year, £856 million pounds of capital funding uh, to local authorities, which has maintained their total share of the capital budget. We have recently commissioned a significant research project on this, particularly focusing on cumulative contributions to strategic investment. And the work which is led by Ryden will report in June 2015, and we would be uh, intending to publish planning advice based on this uh, by the end of the year. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Does the Scottish Government consider that investment in infrastructure should be made in anticipation of population growth rather than in reaction to it? Minister. I think there, there is a space for both and certainly the important process for this to ensure that uh, changes in population can be mitigated is the development planning process. And uh, it's important that that is a very effective process that takes into account current uh, situation, but also anticipated future demand and delivers as appropriate in, in timescales for that. Question seven, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage individuals to use public transportation in order to reduce air pollution. Minister Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government has a range of policies and programmes to make public transport better, more accessible and more affordable and to encourage people to use it. For example, we're investing £5 billion to 2019 to continue improving our rail network and services and up to £246 million in the modernisation of the Glasgow subway. £250 million a year supports the bus network across Scotland and provides free bus travel to around 1.3 million elderly and disabled concession card holders. And we also support Travel Line Scotland to help people plan their journeys and are working with transport operators to deliver smart, cashless ticketing across modes, which will help to make public transport simpler and more attractive to use. Finally, through initiatives such as our Greener Scotland campaign and Smarter Choices, Smarter Places, we encourage individuals to make more sustainable travel choices. John Wilson. I thank the Minister for his detailed response. Yesterday, the UK Supreme Court ruled that the current plans to reduce levels of air pollution were insufficient and that the UK Government must take immediate action, and I presume from that the Scottish Government as well, to reduce air pollution in cities found to have illegal levels of air pollution. It's not just in cities we have high levels of air pollution. We have high pollution levels in certain villages in North Lanarkshire, such as Chapel Hall. What steps does the Scottish Government plan to take to reduce air pollution in light of the ruling from the Supreme Court yesterday? Minister. Uh, well, in addition to the policies that have been uh, set out in terms of climate change, having the most ambitious climate change targets in the world, I can inform the member that there is a low emission strategy consultation. Public consultation on the draft uh, strategy uh, closed on the 10th of April and we have received 67 responses which are currently being reviewed. We will finalise this and publish the strategy at the end of 2015 and that will include proposals such as low emission zones and I am sure the, mel uh, the member uh, will welcome that news. Question 8, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to raise educational attainment in North Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Presiding officer, ensuring that every child reaches their full potential, whatever their background, is at the very heart of our ambition for education. Uh, that's why we launched the Scottish Attainment Challenge, backed up by a £100 million Scottish Attainment Fund. Uh, North Ayrshire is one of the seven local authority areas uh, which has been identified as the first beneficiaries uh, of the fund, uh, which will allow for substantial financial support to be put in place for effective interventions. Uh, North Ayrshire also benefits from the universal support provided for all authorities through a range of existing and new national programmes which are focused on raising attainment and reducing uh, the equity gap. Uh, these include raising attainment for all programme, attainment advisors in every local authority and the Read, Write, Count campaign and the £3 million access to education fund. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I understand that North Ayrshire Council intend to focus on classroom practice, teaching and assisting parents in providing learning support 
for their children. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, please indicate what impact it believes it will have on educational outcomes across North Ayrshire? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Mr Gibson will be pleased to know that I met with the North Ayrshire uh, Council and the other uh, local authorities who are amongst the first uh, to benefit from the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the Scottish Attainment Fund uh, on Monday because all of these local authorities are working very hard uh, to develop and to implement uh, the plans to take forward uh, this ambitious programme. As Mr Gibson knows, tackling inequality is at the very heart of this government's agenda uh, so that every child can succeed in school and gain the skills that they need for life. Uh, all the evidence shows uh, that good quality teachers and teaching uh, are crucial to making a difference, as are programmes which help parents uh, to support their children's learning at home. And I believe that if North Ayrshire and indeed the other local authorities pursue such evidence-based approaches, they will indeed make a big difference to improving uh, educational outcomes and reducing the attainment gap uh, for children uh, living in the most deprived communities. And I will be very happy uh, to share with Mr Gibson, given his interest uh, for his constituencies, uh, the details from the fund uh, and the programme as it develops. Question number nine, Alison Johnson. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards ensuring that every child has the opportunity to undertake on-road cycle training. Minister Derek Mackay. With grant funding from Transport Scotland of £800,000, Cycling Scotland offers all local authorities access to training resources and an instructor training pathway. In 2013-14, 37.4% of primary schools and participating local authorities were providing Bikeability Scotland Level 2 on-road training, uh, up from 31.5% in 2010-11. During 2014-15, 1,095 candidates trained as Bikeability Scotland instructors and an additional 178 schools delivered on-road training. Updated figures for 14-15 will be reported by local authorities to Cycling Scotland and will be available in September 2015. Uh, Alison thank Johnson. Thank you. There's obviously huge in variations in investment and outcome across the country, but I welcome the progress that has been made. It would be a real waste if that training can't be put into practice by our young people because our roads are still too unsafe, too busy, too polluted and congested. And given the damning verdict of the Supreme Court regarding dangerous levels of air pollution, is it not time for the Scottish Government to take the advice of the Association of Public Health Directors and invest a tenth of the transport budget in walking and cycling? Minister. On the first point that Alison Johnston uh, makes, I think there is a range... Uh, of local authorities that are taking up the offer that's made to them by the Scottish Government. I would particularly commend East Remshire Council, where 100% of primary schools are included, and Midlothian, where 87% of primary schools are included. So we'll continue to support education and a range of other policies to encourage people to get involved in active travel. In terms of the financial commitments around active travel, we have kept and delivered our manifesto commitment. And what's more, Alison Johnson is well aware at the Perlon Parliament event at the weekend, I committed to increasing the record amount spent in 14-15 in this financial year, 15-16. And that shows that this government is putting its money where its mouth is when it comes to active transport. Question number 10, Mardo Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to raise the speed limit on A roads for HGVs over 7.5 tonnes. Minister Derek Mackay. There are no current plans to raise the speed limits for HGV vehicles over 7.5 tonnes on single carriageway or dual carriageway roads across Scotland. Mordo Fraser. Uh, I thank the Minister for his response. You'll know that the UK Government has increased the speed limit for HGVs on A roads to 50 miles per hour. It is estimated this move will deliver not just economic benefit, but the reduction in carbon emissions and improved road safety. And the Institute for Advanced Motorists have warned that the Scottish economy uh, could be at an economic disadvantage if we do not follow suit. Clearly, there will also be confusion caused to cross-border traffic, such as heavy goods vehicles using the A75 Euro route heading for Stranraer. Given all this evidence, why won't the Scottish Government take this very sensible move? Minister. The Scottish Government will take an evidence-based approach and the member will be well aware that the change was only uh, implemented from the 6th of April. So I think it's far too premature to make any judgments about uh, the impacts. In terms of consistency, uh, we will certainly make sure that we continue to work with the Road Haulage Association and the Freight Transport Authority and others 
uh, to ensure that the difference between Scotland uh, and England uh, is highlighted. Now, drivers are professional. They understand the difference. Road speed limits are often determined by the characteristics of the road. The reason the Scottish Government does not support the wholesale blanket change that is happening south of the border is a very careful judgment has to be made. The Scottish Government puts safety as paramount. And whilst there may be some economic gain, the very same DFT, the Department for Transport Assessment, said quite clearly uh, that there is a probability of increased fatalities and incidents in the road network south of the border. So understanding that, I think it's entirely right that we take an evidence-based approach in putting both reliability uh, and safety and economy at the forefront of our minds. But we will not take a gamble uh, with the lives of the people of Scotland. Thank you. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery His Excellency Hamza Tibeb, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia.